And welcome everybody to another Smart Money Circle update. I'm Adam Sarhan. With me today is a very special guest, Ben Cohn, CEO of Playboy or PLBY Group. Ben, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Good I always like, thank you. I always like to ask Ben, can you get started? Give us a little background about yourself and how you got to where you are today, your journey and all that fun stuff. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty long story, but I uh, started off as an investment banker, uh, working 80 plus hours a week in M&A. Uh, from there, I moved to private equity and yeah. spent the past 25 years of my career in private equity. And it, it, during that tenure, Playboy was actually one of the companies I took private in 2011, but we invested in some phenomenal entertainment companies, owned one of the largest talent agencies, owned the movie studio behind the Twilight film franchise. And then we did a lot of big minority investments in some of the leading tech companies. So Twitter, Facebook, Square, Snapchat, SpaceX, et cetera. Uh, but look, in 2017, when half passed, I saw an unbelievable opportunity in Playboy. Same thing I had seen in, in 2011 when we took it private, but there wasn't a lot you could do while he was still alive. And so we really had an unbelievable opportunity to transform and revitalize the brand. And that's exactly what we've done. I love it. So can you talk to us a little about, I love that you're an investment banker and a private equity guy. So this is going to be a really good conversation. I didn't know that. So um, tell us about the business of Playboy, where it is today, and what the vision is going forward, the different departments you have, business profit centers, so on and so forth. Yeah, so I mean, look, Playboy, let's start about what, what is Playboy, right? Playboy is one of the top five brands in the world. Maybe it's the top three brand in the world. We sell product in 180 countries. Consumers spend billions of dollars buying our products and services around the world. Uh, the problem was when I took over the business is we were a media company and a licensing business. And they really got into licensing to offset the losses from media. Right. What I think they lost focus of is what was the brand started as in 1953? It was started as a lifestyle brand. Lifestyle. This is a brand whose first consumer product was a pair of cufflinks. You actually wore it on your shirt sleeve, right? This is a company that had casinos and resorts and a whole host of other businesses but I think the problem was the leadership thought of themselves as a media company. And so they focused all of their business efforts on trying to drive advertising revenue, where I would argue Playboy should never have advertising revenue. Because when you are a brand, how do you sell advertising on a CPM basis when you're trying to stay true to who you are as a brand? And so what we focused on, and the first thing I did actually when I took over as CEO is I put everyone in a room and they said, what does Playboy stand for? And mm -hmm. unfortunately at the time, I got a hundred different answers. And there was about 100 people in the room. And so you went back and you said, wait a minute, how the hell do you guys do anything if you don't know who you are? Right. And so we came up with a very clear mission statement, which is to create a culture where all people can pursue pleasure and focus the business really around pleasure, enabling pleasure in your life and leaning back into what I would say is these core libertarian principles that really existed when the company was started. Uh, these are things that half back in the day believed in, but, you know, talking about sex positivity, talking about, you know, even with Roe versus Wade right now, a woman's right to choose, right? The Ruth Bader Ginsburg letter to the company. And so we focused on these libertarian First Amendment freedom of expression uh, points of view and really tried to refocus the company back on it being a lifestyle brand. And so what we ended up doing was shutting down the legacy media business, right? Got rid of, adver got, got rid of advertising, got rid of the sales force mm -hmm. and focused about on, on really where consumers were spending money as sort of the low hanging fruit, which was buying Playboy products and services or products around the world, right? In China, we're one of the largest men's fashion brands, right? 3,500 points of sale, whether that be e-commerce or brick and mortar. What we started doing was reinventing the business model in the United States where we thought we had domain expertise. So taking what was a licensing business and moving that to a direct to consumer business. That business has grown unbelievably well. And then we bought other companies to supplement the skill sets that we lacked internally. Where we're going is we're really creating this Playboy ecosystem. And that ecosystem starts with something that the company originally started with, which was working with phenomenal influencers and creators around the world that is our centerfold product, right? So bringing, bringing those creators in, having a longstanding relationship with them and creating this lifestyle ecosystem where consumers can interact with those creators, whether that be through digital subscription, premium unlocks, video chats with that consumer, 
with that cons with that influencer then recommending and promoting Playboy products where the consumers are buying those products, or actually participating in in real life events or virtual events with those creators. And so I believe we are creating something that is truly different, truly differentiated. And when you think about this creator economy, which some people estimate to be a hundred billion dollars, we are the one platform that has a true brand that stands behind it. I love that. So you basically go after creators, people with an audience or influencers and say, hey, listen, we want to have a partnership where the creator is going to be incentivized from a monetary standpoint to promote the Playboy products and or experiences. And then you both win, you and the creator. Is that do I hear you properly? I think in, in the simplest terms, yes. I think what we're really doing at the end of the day is we're creating a SaaS business. We are creating a set of tools for creators to be able to monetize their audiences. And what our secret sauce behind that is the Playboy discovery engine, right? We, we over the years, over the past 70 years, have broken um, some of the biggest creators in the world, right? We gave them their first start. And so what we're doing is reinventing what used to be the magazine into this new digital creator first uh, ecosystem. And mm -hmm. then the benefit that the creators get for working with us is they get to become affiliates. They get to earn additional revenue streams through our consumer products business as well. I love that. So um, what about the, I know NFTs are really big uh, part of what's happening here. Can you speak about that with crypto and any thoughts there, please? Sure. So we've had some very successful projects uh, over the past 12 months where we've tested a lot of things. This is a company who is 70 years young uh, this year. Uh, you know, just like, the piece, Happy birthday, you uh, just like the piece of art behind me, you know, we have 5,000 pieces of art. We have a 10 million piece archive. And I believe that when you think through the blockchain, there are new ways to exploit and build community through the blockchain and through NFTs. Um, and so last year we tested a number of things and this year, you know, we're working on a very exciting project uh, to help unlock the value of that archive that we own. I love that. So are you doing anything in the metaverse in addition to the NFTs or is it just the uh, NFTs for now? No, I think it's all, it's all web three at the end of the day. And so okay. obviously the metaverse allows us to reach a much larger audience than we can through an in real life event. So an in real life event, you know, we probably had the most successful party last year at Art Basel mm -hmm. uh, in December, but yeah. it, it capacity was 250 people. Right. right. Through the metaverse, and we had a holiday party in the metaverse, we had thousands of people show up. Unlimited, yeah. So this brand sits at that perfect intersection between both the digital and physical worlds, between digital goods and physical goods. And so all of that is in our roadmap. This year in 2022, we're staying really focused on two priorities, which is continuing the expansions of our D2C business and then building out what is our creator-led platform, which is you know project name Center, Centerfold today, and working on integrating all of this into one cohesive ecosystem. As we move forward to the end of the year and going into next year, you know, we, we really have an endless organic runway. It's just a question of making sure this year we're staying extremely focused on these two, what I would say is really base building, um, you know, establishing the foundation, making sure that is set before we continue to expand. No, that's very smart and very strategic. So um, on that note, going forward, can you talk about your competitive advantages? Yeah, I, look, the biggest competitive advantage we have is a brand, right? And I think that in this cluttered Amazon world that we live in today, Brands are the true differentiator, and that's what stands out. And so, you know, I've said this a lot, but when you think about what would it cost to replicate Playboy today on a global basis, and I would challenge you, you couldn't do it, right? <laughs> you it couldn't, be, I'll tell you, it's impossible, yeah. It would be impossible, right? right? And so you're talking about one of the top five brands in the world. Right. That's billions and billions of dollars. And so I think that brand elicits, the Playboy brand elicits an emotional connection in the consumer, whether it be good or bad, it elicits a, a connection. Right. Um, or feeling. And so I think that is our true differentiator that we have, which is the Playboy brand. And it's why when you look at the other companies we bought, we're aligning everything around our hero brand. I love that. So I'm going to ask you, Ben, to wear the private equity hat and slash investment banker hat for a little bit here and talk about the, uh, the way you handle risk. How do you handle risk? And then what are some mistakes you see people make with respect to risk management now that you're running the business? Yeah, obviously, you know, um, different running a business than being in private equity, but right. I think taking the investor hat to how we operate every single day. So at, at the end of the day, I'm a fiduciary. I was a fiduciary for big institutions and state pensions 
plans before. I'm mm -hmm. a fiduciary at the end of the day for the public shareholders, right? They're the, they're at the end of the day, my true boss. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, we try to make very smart capital allocations and we try to get ahead of risk where, you know, where we see things coming up down the road. We're trying to do that. I think the business transformation is exactly that. I mean, if you look back at what we, I inherited in 2017, it was a $70 million business with 50% of our revenue coming from China, right? And probably 100% of our profitability. And I looked at that and said, well, you know, she, that's, that's, a lot, that's a lot of risk, right? <laughs> right. At, at some point, things could turn. Right. And so we know we are getting, uh, leaving a lot of money on the table in China. Our efforts to change that business model have obviously been slowed down because of COVID. Right. But that's a perfect example of managing risk. And so what did we do? Well, I made some very smart acquisitions, buying things at three to five times cash flow to give us enough scale to diversify away from China. I also needed to buy Honey Burdette and other things so that the digital business that I wanted to build, right, which was part of our plan originally, I actually had the capital, the mm -hmm. EBITDA and the revenue from other business lines, which is the low hanging fruit, which is the consumer products to actually have the financial wherewithal to go out and build the creator side of the business. And so it's a multi-year, it's a multi-year plan. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't happen overnight. There's two ways to do it. You either do it through cash flow, which I like to do, or you can do it by raising a lot of money, which a lot of tech companies have done. Right. Um, I, I like having the underlying cash flow at the end of the day. But look, I think I think risk is is clearly looking for at the big picture, getting yourself out of the four walls, which sometimes running companies become all encompassing. Yes. Um, especially when you have 1,200 employees, mm -hmm. um, and, and thinking through what are the things that could go wrong. You know, same thing of like my my you know mantra in private equity, which is the only deal you wanted to do was a deal that you couldn't convince yourself why not to do it. Right. Right. And and right. so you always want to be the devil's advocate, the Debbie Downer of why not to do a deal. Those are the deals that you want to do. Yeah. And no. I think the same thing with with running a company is what are all the things that could go wrong and how do then do we strategically plan to address those issues? Yeah, I know. I love that. So I have a new book out. It's called Psychological Analysis. It was number one on Amazon for a while. And the exactly. basic, thank you very much. And the basic premise there speaks to that point right there. It's defense first. Before you enter, know where you're going to exit and how much you're going to risk if you're wrong. And if you're comfortable with the max risk, go ahead, take the trade. If you don't, then don't do it. It's just that simple. A hundred, a hundred percent. Look, the, the, the best defense is good offense as well. Right. And so yeah. it's a combination of managing both of those, but Look, I, I knew that long term, in order to have the negotiating leverage I needed with our Chinese partners, but also that if their payment didn't show up one time, what was I going to do? Right. I had to fail the business in other areas, even though they might be the less attractive areas. They were the areas that I knew I could scale in day one so yes. that we had the we had the negotiating leverage long term to be diversified away from the risk areas. I love this. So, Ben, a few questions here. So. You've invested in many businesses over your career. You're now running Playboy. What are some timeless lessons you've learned along the way that you'd like to share with the audience? Look, I think the, the timeless lesson behind every business is it comes down to management, right? Mm -hmm. I, I can give you a great business <laughs> and a horrible management team, and it won't be a very good investment. And I can give right. you a mediocre business with a good management team, and it will turn out to be okay. Right. I think that at the end of the day, um, is lesson number one. I think lesson number two is is keep it simple. Mm -hmm. um, and lesson number three is, um, you know, and, and this is this is what really becomes a challenge as a public company is is the public markets sometimes have unrealistic expectations right. for growth. Uh, you know, I don't like being dependent upon third parties to finance our business. And so you, there's trade-offs all the time that you can make. Uh, you know, call me, call me old school. Uh, I've been through enough cycles before and we're about to enter a new one. Yes. But I think that um, it, it's a question of making sure that you manage what the market's expectations of growth are mm -hmm. uh, with what your financial balance sheet is. And, and can you do everything that the market wants you to do? Uh, because those definitely come at a trade off. And I would rather, you know, I would rather run the marathon than the sprint. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. So how do you manage those expectations? analyst expectations and or whatever and shareholder expectations or the market's expectations as now being CEO? Yeah, look, I would say it's been a great learning lesson the last, the last year and a half, um, you know, and so it, I think we're getting better at it and that's what I want to see. I, I don't want to make the same mistake twice. 
Gotcha. Uh, I'm okay making the same mistake once, but not mm. twice. Yeah. And so it's a question of trying of trying to balance that. And unfortunately, you'll never be able to satisfy everyone. Uh, I think you have to stay core to what your plan is and core to what your organization can handle. Yep. And, you know, stocks go up and down. I've been through enough cycles before. Um, and eventually over time, if you execute, uh, the, stock should, the stock should appreciate just as enterprise value of a company should appreciate in private equity. Yeah, oh yeah, 100%. So what are some timeless mistakes that you've seen people make and how do you avoid them? I think timeless mistakes are not being honest, right? I, I think at the end of the day, I think everyone is competitive if you're in business to some extent. I, mm -hmm. I think it's not realizing when to sort of pull the ripcord. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, wh when, when do you not double down anymore? This is not working. Um, and I go back to, you know, the timeless mistakes are really looking at the core root of, of what, why did something go wrong mm -hmm. um, versus sometimes data, uh, data is all about, you know, garbage in, garbage out. And yeah. did you analyze it the proper way? And I think it, it's really about um, debating that in retrospect and making sure that there's lessons that uh, you don't, you, you don't make the same mistake the second time. Gotcha. Now you've been, you, you are a leader, you've invested in leaders earlier. You mentioned management as being super important. From your point of view, Ben, what makes a great leader? Okay, I think a great leader is someone that knows their limitations first and foremost, mm -hmm. um, and someone that surrounds themselves with people that are better than they are, or smarter, whatever whatever you want to use as an adjective, mm -hmm. uh, than they are. And so I make the best decisions when I'm surrounded by people that have more domain expertise in their respective areas mm -hmm. than I have. I, I can make an informed decision. I just need the data to make that informed decision. And I think there's two types of leaders. So there's leaders that have big egos that believe they know everything. And there are <laughs> leaders that, uh, you know, say, I don't know everything. I know my limitations and I'm going to surround myself with people that are better than I am in those respective areas. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how I like to view myself um, is I, I like to surround myself and I get energized by surrounding myself with people that I know have more domain expertise in those areas and I can listen to them and make informed decisions based on the feedback they're giving. I might not agree with them all the time, yeah. but at least I know I'm getting the right data. No, I love that. So we're very similar. It's our first time meeting, first time speaking, but I've had a similar journey on my, my career, my life so far. I started off not knowing anything and on Wall Street and trading, on investing, all that kind of stuff. I was fascinated with it as a kid and I knew I didn't know. So that became my greatest strength. And I said, I have one job and that's to go out there and learn. <laughs> Well, that's it. <laughs> look, and I don't care how, how successful you are, right? You can always learn. And I think that's the biggest thing is, you know, is, is staying humble and, and keeping the mindset that you can always learn and you can always improve. And, um, you know, it doesn't matter how successful you are. Again, it's, it's that mindset that I always can do better. Um, and that's something I try to talk to our teams about, which is, you know, did we have a great year last year? We did. Did we have a good first quarter? We did. Can we do better? 100%. And so it, it, we you cannot be satisfied with what we did. What we did, the markets don't care about. The markets care about what you're going to do. 100% agree. I, I always joke around. It's like you can pull out of your car, your driveway, we look in the rear of your mirror. But once you start driving, if you look like that, you're toast. So every time you look at an earnings report, it's what already happened. The market's looking forward. Most people are looking backwards. So they, they, they miss that part of it. That's Yeah. And, and the other thing people have to realize is things aren't linear, right? Things don't always go in the same thing. You, you might be in step function where, you know, you have to take a step back to take two steps forward. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, and that's, that's just something, you know, one, probably the biggest lesson I've learned you know, moving, having invested in stocks, but having not run a public company before mm -hmm. is in private equity, you know, you have one boss, which used to be me as a, as a management team, right. right? You can afford to make different decisions than you can make in a public company. Look, it's one of the things I think the worst thing about being a public company is I, I think no one runs a business on a quarterly basis, even though you're required to report quarterly. I, I wish the U.S. markets would go to semi-annual reporting versus mm -hmm. quarterly because trying to manage things on a quarterly basis is almost impossible, right? And you end up making the wrong long-term decisions in, in for short-term profits. And I always talk to the team about 
let's not worry about the quarter. Let's think about what we, where we're going over the next three to five years. Let's stay focused on that. Let's not stay focused on the quarter. Yeah, it's almost like when you watch a YouTube video and you can change the speed, you can go one X, one quarter, 1.5, one, you know, it's like two X. Now that's how you watch YouTube. But if you watch it at five X, you're not gonna understand anything they're saying. The time goes by so fast. If you look quarter to quarter, it's it's just 12 weeks. I mean, that's, it's like watching it at five X. It's just, it's not, you miss the whole thing. Yeah, I couldn't. Yeah, it tends to be a distraction actually, right? Cause people get start to focus on a quarter instead of saying, hey, look, we have something that we're building out over the next year. Yeah two years, that's what's most important. It's not about trying to accelerate things into a quarter. Understood 100%. So let's talk about um, obstacles. In, in order to, to be where you are today, you had to overcome some obstacles. Do you mind sharing some of those obstacles with us and how you overcame them, how, what lessons you learned from them so they don't repeat them? I love what you said earlier, make a mistake once, but don't make it twice. So if you could speak to that a little bit, we'd appreciate it. Yeah, look, I think the biggest obstacles, you know, one are just people, right? Is is as much as people and employees are are things that help you succeed. It's also a question of getting smarter along the way on, you know, who's made mistakes, who's made mistakes multiple times over. Mm -hmm. um, and the other obstacles that I've had to overcome a lot are a lot of the companies that I have bought historically needed massive restructurings. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, that that has a human toll to it it's probably the hardest thing in my job um, is um, is actually the human side of it, right? Sometimes you have to let really nice people go. Right. Um, and it's a question of always uh, doing that with, with dignity and knowing that you're dealing with a human on the other side of it. Right. right. And, and me, um, you know, it, it's how I live my personal life um, from a, from a moral perspective. It's how, how I think you have to be in business as well when you're dealing with humans. Um, but I, I think that, you know the big thing is 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 the restructurings and you know the obstacles I've had to overcome. A lot of the times when I took over Playboy, I think I had six or seven weeks of cash left. How, how do you how do you change a business like that? Wow. Right. And so um, we've been able to do that, and you know, making sure that. Um, you know, as you expand, you're, you're constantly looking for areas. I, I sort of go back to Jack Welsh, Six Sigma. Um, you know, I think every company, there are ways to take costs out of the business every single year to constantly improve. Right. Uh, sometimes you, 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 that gets pushed down because there's so many other things going on. But I think as we enter this next financial cycle, um, you know, I, I think that you're seeing a lot of companies do this and it's something that, uh, you know, we've done before and it's something that every company should be doing constantly. So would you, you talk about Welsh when he went in there and he just said, hey, listen, here are all the, I guess, metrics for measuring performance and then just cut the bottom quarter, bottom 10% or whatever the case is of people that just aren't performing based on uh, that? You know? I actually think it's a great, it, it's a great thing. I think you look at the end of the day, um, you know, this was, this was not a performance driven business for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I think the one thing that when you go back to sort of the old GE days was yeah. it was a performance driven organization. And it was because you had to perform or you were not going to be there. Yeah. And I actually think that's a healthy thing for businesses going forward. Okay. Um, and, you know, you, you see, you know, the last couple of weeks, a lot of these tech companies laying off, you know, 10, 15, 20% of their workforce. Right. The question is, why were you ever in that situation to begin with? Right. That's very powerful. They weren't lean and mean. <laughs> they weren't lean and mean. And, and you know, I, I think that, um, you know, it's, it's something we're talking about internally now is, is you got to be lean and mean. It's, it's very, very important. 100%. Okay. Next question for you, Ben. How do you handle adversity? Uh, I surround myself with people that are, that are very good. And I ask them their opinions and try to make a, uh, you know, an informed decision. Love it. And then what advice would you give your 30-year-old or 25-year-old self? Great question. I, I would say, uh, you know, be humble. Um, be humble. Continue to learn. Don't think you know everything. I, I think that, um, you know, when I was 30, I had a lot of success. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's always, I have, I have a phenomenal wife who keeps me grounded all the time. And I think uh, it, it's great to, it's great to maintain who you are and not lose focus sight of that. Agreed hundred percent. So 
with that humility in mind and adversity surrounding yourself with great people, what's the best piece of advice you'd like to share with the audience, whether it's your 30 year old self or if it's anybody else or people that want to come up and they have aspirations to be CEO or be a good investor, just what's some overall just tricks of the trade that you'd like to share with the audience? Biggest piece of advice is to listen. You learn a lot more from someone or about a situation by listening, asking questions. I, I, I always like to say to you know, our, um, my colleagues, ask questions. Don't, don't tell someone, ask them a question, right? right? It's like you can lead a camel to water by asking questions. You can't force it to drink. Correct. I love and that. that. That to me is the biggest thing is constantly asking questions. Don't come in and dictate. That's so powerful. So this whole show is what exactly what I do. I show up, I just ask questions and I listen. <laughs> and the audience can still listen. Well, Ben, this has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you kindly. Anything else uh, that I didn't ask that you'd like to share before we wrap up today? No, I, I can't wait to read your book. I'm going to go buy it on Amazon. And, oh, thank you kindly. Um, yeah, looking forward to reading it. Hopefully we'll have you on again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.